subject of initial descent of man on the planet Earth can sometimes be regarded as a subject only for fiction writers and especially what was known as science fiction. People have been coming up with various hypotheses on when man first came upon the Earth. According to the Darwinian theory, man has evolved upon this Earth and his evolution is not a very old one. Perhaps it's about 500,000 years old, maybe a million years old. And if the beginning of this universe started at 12 o'clock and the time now is 5.30, it is estimated that man came upon the earth about 5.28 p.m. So this shows that man's advent upon this planet is a very recent one. But some researchers have felt that this is not a correct estimate since the Leakey investigations made by the famous Leakey family, Professor Leakey and his son, Professor Leakey Jr. and their daughter, which are now available with the National Geographic Society. Those investigations seem to suggest that man was here much earlier than Darwin predicted or calculated. We have now found fossilized forms which would suggest that man was here not only more than a million years earlier, but even 10 million years earlier. I think the most recent find suggests that there was evidence of man upon Earth 20 million years ago. So the whole concept of evolution is undergoing a fresh review, a fresh look at this concept would suggest that perhaps there have been several streams of men coming upon this and that whereas in one stream of evolution man descended upon the earth or evolved on this earth about half a million years ago but there were other streams in which man had appeared upon the earth much earlier and there is no reason to to disbelieve a statement made by some thinker that man has always been here through different streams of evolution. It is very difficult to reject the suggestion that man could have been on this planet right from the beginning when the planet was hospitable enough to receive him. And that the evolution theory based upon the species that now exist upon Earth is only a partial answer to the question. Now, this much for the scientific uh, discoveries made after Darwin explained his theory of evolution. The more interesting researches in recent times have been directed at examining the physical body of the man and trying to understand whether he fits in with his environment. It is found that almost all living things and growing things with a metabolic process in them on this earth have a proportion of elements in them which bears correspondence with the proportion of elements in their environment. But this is not true in the case of a human being. It has been noticed that the elements in the human body are not bearing any proportion to the elements as they exist in nature. And the suggestion is sometimes made that man must be a foreign body upon this earth. Now, while theories are still being formulated to explain the different physical structure of man compared to the physical structure of all living beings, we have now even seriously started considering the possibility of man having come from outer space at some point of time. Some interesting science fiction stories are circulating in which it is suggested that God might be an astronaut who came long ago and brought the first seed of man and planted it upon earth. There is also evidence to show that perhaps a woman is not so foreign to this planet as a man. In the case of a woman, it appears she has more resemblance to the other beings upon this earth whose proportion of elements in their physical form has a 
direct correspondence with the proportion of those elements in the environment around. Hence, it is suggested that this is a cross, a mixed breed between a man who was planted from outer space with a woman who belongs locally to the Earth. And this theory is gaining ground recently among scientific thinkers. It is difficult to understand why man should be so different from others. The fact he is different is easily noticed. Man alone can see color with his eyes. Why should he be alone in this entire universe to see the colors which he can notice? It appears there is no other living creature that can see the colors that the man's eyes can see. And this has now been established by scientific evidence. Why should man be so unique if he is just a product of evolution upon this earth? Man seems to have a very unique position upon this earth. So much for raising a question on the uniqueness of man on this earth. The solutions which science will eventually offer may fit in with the propositions which some science fiction writers are making or with the propositions which we might make in our imagination. But the answers to these questions which mystics and philosophers of the East have given now bear a, a greater chance of scrutiny by the Western scientists. And the propositions that they have made is that man's advent upon the Earth, planet Earth, has been a continuing process. And in cycles of birth and rebirth, man has always been here upon this planet. And there has always been some earth or other in this cosmos upon which man has survived. The Eastern mystics, through their extraordinary mystical powers of traversing through time, both forward and backward, and thus being able to see the history of all creation, thus being able to see the beginning of time, have been able to put forth these hypotheses that as far as they can look back in history of man, they discover that man was always there in this universe. There was not a single moment when man disappeared from some planet or heavenly body, something similar to the earth upon which he resided. Therefore, according to the Eastern mystics, man has not fixed any particular time to come upon this earth. He has been there at all times. And this view supports the other theories that the Eastern mysticism uh, encompasses. For example, the theory of the law of karma. That would fall to pieces if man was not there at a certain time. Because the theory of the law of karma, which says that whatever you uh, sow, so shall you reap, whatever action you do, you will receive a reaction to that. That theory requires that there should be a being capable of acting, capable of deciding, capable of doing something to which there is a reaction. It is only a human being who has that capability on this planet Earth today. If the law of karma has to survive time, then it is necessary that man must also continue to thrive throughout time. The Eastern belief is that man has so survived and therefore the law of karma has been a continuous process. It is possible that man came in civilizations which have been destroyed, which may be under the sea, the Atlantis being one example, or there have been various species which have come up and leading to the placement of man upon a particular part of the earth and they have all gone down and there is no evidence left. But if the other phenomena which is today still described as mystical phenomena, but tomorrow may be described as scientific evidence. If the other phenomena is to be properly explained, we have to believe the Eastern mystics proposition that man has always been on this earth and there was no particular point of time when he made his advent upon it. Now I am talking all this while about the physical planet earth and man's presence here. Spiritually speaking, where we talk of levels of consciousness and we think of the higher astral planes and causal planes, of course, there is a different a theory to suggest 
that man has come from time to time from higher regions into the lower regions. According to those theories, man's descent upon this planet Earth, which means man's descent into the physical form, has taken place after a dissolution. There are two kinds of dissolutions described, the grand dissolution and the dissolution. It is said that in a dissolution, the entire physical system is, gets burnt up and destroyed and returns into its original form of energy. And in the new creation, the energy again gives a big bang and then again physical forms are created and man comes back again. So to that extent, uh, possibly man has come upon the physical form after every dissolution when new creation took place. And man has left this uh, physical form in every dissolution. In the grand dissolution, it says that not only man, but even his mind, even the thinking power, and all the sensory perceptions that he possesses are destroyed and finished. In the grand dissolution, everything is dissolved, except the consciousness of man or the soul of man, which persists even in uh, grand dissolution and retains its character waiting for the new creation to take place when it can come back again into the mental regions and from there down to the astral and physical regions. So man's advent in the spiritual hierarchy is really taking place every time there's a dissolution or a grand dissolution. And man comes back every time there's a new creation after such an event. But it is necessary to remember that these dissolutions are not referring to physical dissolutions. They are referring to dissolutions even at the higher levels of consciousness. There is a belief that the man's con uh, control over the earth is arising out of his reason. That man is the only rational animal and therefore he is unique. If this be so, then it is obvious that he is deriving all his powers from his mind. And his mind is arising from the second level of consciousness, which is sometimes called the Trikuti, the top of the three worlds, the three worlds being the worlds of beginning, middle and end. So when mind is the source of all power of rationality, and that is the power which makes man the supreme master of this earth, and naturally it is necessary to study what happens to Trikuti during these dissolutions. The Eastern mystics philosophy says that Trikuti itself is destroyed during a dissolution and therefore the mind, the universal mind and all that it holds is also destroyed along with it. Then it would be proper to say that so far as man as we know him on this earth is concerned, his advent upon this earth takes place when a new Trikuti is made and a new creation takes place from that level downwards. It is true to say that man's advent is from that point because whatever we know of man is what is held in his mind. We do not know much about man beyond his mind. We have no notion of a mind, of a man's spirit or soul. His mind is visible. The impressions, what we call sanskars, which a man's mind carries, they affect his behavior towards other men. They affect his attitude towards life. The various individual events that occur in his life because of karma also regulate his life. These sanskars and these karmas make up the whole man. The pralabdha or the previous uh, karma with which a man is born and as a result of which he undergoes certain actions without his will are the ones that really make a man as we know him. They determine where a man will be born, who he will marry, when he will fall sick, when he will meet with an accident, when coincidences will take place, when strange happenings without his thinking and volition will take place. So the men that we know of are really the product of these forces. And so man upon this earth is really a product of karma and sanskars of the past. Such a man naturally has come into being only when the karma and the sanskars came into being, which was with the creation of Trikuti. Let me at this point intervene to point out that when we say that man's advent is at this point in time, we are not saying that the time ceases to exist. 
and then it started again or that it's a continuous stream in which dissolution takes place and time remains in a state of suspension. The fact of the matter is that man's advent upon the planet Earth creates its own time. The time is created by man to fulfill the karma which he carries with him. There is no absolute time which exists without man. Time is, is created along with man. And this is uh, best to, to be remembered at this point because we frequently make an assumption that time is always there whether there was dissolution or no dissolution. Let me illustrate my point with reference to the dream state with which we are very familiar. We all go to sleep at night and have dreams. The question is, the time that flows in the dream, is it the same time that flows outside or is it different? For instance, I can have a dream in which I can go to a very old historical monument which I have never seen before and there is a guide who is showing me the stones on that monument full of moss and green color and he says this monument is 1400 years old see the bricks see the moss see the grass and the old trees around it surely this is a very old monument and I appreciate the time this monument has stood on that ground 1400 years but the dream in which this monument has been seen lasted only a few minutes Perhaps I have dreamt only seven minutes when this monument came into being. The total life of the monument was not more than seven minutes. Seven minutes ago it did not exist. And now the monument exists along with its history of 1400 years. Therefore, the 1400 years of history of that monument was created now for the purpose of this dream. It is different from the 1400 years as we know in wakeful state. In the dream state, we can create time to sustain a particular experience. In the same way, when man walks wakefully upon this earth, he creates the time to sustain the experience he is going through. He creates time both backwards and forwards. He creates his past in order to give the feeling that there is a continuity of time. He creates a future in order to give continuity of what he is doing now that will go on forever. The same thing is true of space also. Supposing that guide in the dream had told me, look at that wonderful blue sky with streaks of clouds in it and look at that moon much larger than usual shining up there and look at the sky beyond the moon, infinite and large. I would perhaps think it is really an infinite space we have created. And that space has come into being only when the dream started. What happened to that infinity before the dream started? It wasn't there. It means that in a finite dream, one can create an infinite experience. This is a very important point because we are often confused by the concepts of finite and infinite. An infinite is a concept. The infinite sky, infinite time, infinite space, these are concepts. These concepts are created within a very finite experience of man. Thus, while man is on this earth, he has created an infinite past and an infinite future for himself. It does not mean that he has been infinitely here. He has brought this time with its infinities along with him during a finite experience. Now, upon this presumption that man has been here only when Trikuti was created, can we examine what happens when Trikuti is not there? Where does this man go? And who is this man? What is the nature of man who walks upon this earth? I have frequently explained that man is not the physical body because the physical body has advent only for the short time of 50, 60, 100 years that it lives. But man goes beyond these 50 or 60, 100 years. And there is enough evidence now to show that there is life after death and that consciousness persists. What is the form of that consciousness which persists? Because we should truly regard that consciousness as man and not the physical body. When we hear accounts of people with having experience of life after death, 
we find that even after they lose this physical body, there is still some form. They still retain the experience of seeing, of walking, of talking, of listening, of doing things, of moving in apartments, of haunting the houses, of becoming ghosts and whatnot. It appears that all these entities who seem to be people who have left their physical bodies still seem to have some body with which they do all these things. They are certainly not a point of consciousness that is just uh, held up somewhere. They seem to have a form which they use. They move around with that form. What could be that form? Now, those who have studied the nature of astral form of human beings know that this is a form similar to the human body and represents the capacity to have sense perceptions, including the perception of touch. The perception of touch gives it the same form as the human body. The other sense perceptions are located similarly in the astral eyes, in the astral ears, in the astral nose, and so on, so that the astral body of man, which survives after he dies in the physical body, is of the same shape and same nature as the physical body. So therefore, if that is the man, then his advent upon this earth is much earlier than the birth of the physical body. How long does the astral body live? Is there any calculation on that? The Eastern mystics tell us that there is a very large, long life for astral bodies. They have one long life in which they can have birth into physical form several times. So several physical men come into being who are nothing else but the same astral man. And when they wake up into astral form, they remember their previous dreams as physical men and they also remember their life in the astral world. The astral world, therefore, is the world of the real man. And that man has come upon that world much earlier than man walked upon the earth. Where is this astral world? Is it somewhere out in space? Or is it out here? Well, it could, if we, even if it is in space, it would be here too, because earth is also in the same space. Even if we say that the astral life is in some other planet, it should be also on this planet. If the astral life merely means the consciousness of man without the physical body, it should be available on earth also. And if all these spirits that move around and haunt houses are on this earth, then the astral life should also be upon this earth. Therefore, it seems to us that the astral life or the astral world is not somewhere else. It may be a larger world. You may be able to go into space to many other places to see astral beings and astral people. But the astral world includes this earth also. And to that extent, when you put a question like the one posed in the title of today's talk, when did man first come upon this earth, planet earth, the answer should include the time when he came in his astral form upon this planet earth. The philosophers of the East have no doubt that man walked upon this earth in his astral form far earlier than he walked upon it with the physical body. Therefore, it would not be wrong to say that even when the earth was a molten piece still cooling off as a chunk thrown out from the sun by a blast, man in his astral form was walking upon it and trying to determine which would be the appropriate moment when it can be used for physical habitation. That man would be doing the same thing now in a large galaxy cannot be ruled out. If man is the astral form and in the astral form he is not the physical body and is not liable to the damages which fire and heat and other forms of oppressive energies upon this earth can cause, then surely he would not be afraid even to walk upon the sun and the moon. And indeed, the Eastern mystics and philosophers believe that man does today walk in his astral form upon the sun and the moon and other planets. And their belief is that that is the same man who takes birth as a physical man. He's not a different man. It's not a different species. The same astral man who walks upon these stars and planets then takes birth in the physical grosser form in a lower level of consciousness as a physical being. 
and as a physical being he gets subjected to the dangers of the physical elements cannot stand the heat and light and energies beyond a certain point and therefore has to confine his existence to a few planets which have cooled off reasonably to make it habitable for man thus man in his various forms is inhabiting this universe all over and the astral man who has a much longer life and has a form similar to this man is the real man who comes upon this earth when it is cooling down in this uh, view of things uh, man's continued stay on this earth in the astral form would suggest that man is not new and the stories of astronauts bringing man's seed upon this earth do not appear to be valid on the other hand if the statement that some astronauts in the name of god or astronauts who were god brought the seed of man upon this earth is to be taken to mean that the astral form of man became physical and took birth here in physical form when the earth cooled down then of course one can accept those fiction tales also those science fiction stories also to conclude i would say that man has been on this earth planet earth in his astral form ever since the earth came into being when there was no earth even then the astral man was around but since the question poses when did he come upon this earth the answer is in his astral form he came when the earth came into being in physical form he came upon this earth when the earth cooled enough to make it habitable for him and his physical structure to withstand the elements on this sir this would be the answer to the question posed thank you uh dr prairie can we say then that uh earlier man had a form different than man as we know today the experiments conducted by professor leakey and others in africa in the coal mines have revealed that basically man's form was the same then as it is now and the slight differences in form over a period of time are not so material as to say that he was quite different so physical man has had more or less the same appearance all the time even the astral form of man has not been very different it resembles the physical form quite a lot so i would say the form of man in the astral and physical forms has been the same but there is a higher form as i said in trikuti or in the universal mind region which is a mental form of man that does not bear resemblance to either the astral form or the physical form and if you talk of the period after a grand dissolution when creation starts from the point of trikuti then of course man has a different form but then this in some way cast some doubt on Darwin's theory of evolution. Oh yes, certainly. I said in the beginning that Professor Leakey's uh, experiments themselves have thrown uh, Professor Darwin's uh, theory out of focus altogether. And he had predicted by his general theory of evolution that uh, man could only step on this earth about uh, 500,000 years ago. And now there's enough evidence to show that man was upon this very earth 10 million years ago. Now we are just trying to fit in with new theories. How Darwin could also be justified, and we say, well, Darwin was talking of this strain of man, and maybe another strain of man existed earlier with the same process of evolution, which has disappeared now, and there is no evidence left. So we think there may be many strains of man who came, but certainly the original concept of Darwin, there was only one strain of man, and he came so recently, has been thrown out of focus by the new discoveries of Professor Leakey. How do you get the different races of man? It's just uh, does that also is that does that also have like a astral explanation? The races of men have been explained by the uh, environmental uh, factor upon man on Earth. Mm-hmm. All races have evolved out of an environmental factor upon man, but that is true of other living creatures also. And races of men refer to the physical form of the man. Uh, so far as I know. 
from the teachings of the Eastern mystics, they do not think that there are any races in the astral man. In the earlier evolution, so-called evolution of man, in his first advent on Earth from astral man to physical man, were the distinctions so great as to give any inference that man was somewhat resembled the ape as we know the ape today? No, there is no such thing. Of course, the ape resembles the man. He does many things which men can do. He can hold things. He can look at you with his eyes as if he is like a human being. He is an animal closest to man. And according to Darwin's theory, the evolution occurred through the ape becoming man. There is a missing link which they can't find out. But the fact of the matter is that ape has never been a man and man has never been an ape, either in astral form or in physical form. Ape is an ape and man is a man. And man has always been a man, has never been an ape. And an ape has always been an ape and never been a man. Well, when man initially came to this planet Earth, did he also have the astral awareness? Or did he just pick up, was it a gradual pickup of the matter here? Or was it a sudden pickup? The astral awareness is always with man. He does not fully lose it even now. Even now, if you see men here who are using their sensory perceptions and imagination, are mostly relying upon their astral power. The power, as, uh, the power of the astral man has not decreased at all. And the awareness that we describe as the physical awareness is still astral awareness. What has happened is that man still retaining his astral awareness, still exercising his astral power, has gone into an illusion, or rather a delusion, in which he believes that the physical world is real. And the astral world is unreal. It is this belief which is the delusion. And this delusion is holding man away from his astral self. But the astral powers are there. Supposing the astral awareness of man is withdrawn, no physical awareness is left. There is no such thing as physical awareness. It is astral awareness in a physical body which is called physical awareness. Awareness is only astral. The physical body has no awareness of its own. It is only when the astral man resides in a physical body that the physical body functions like a living thing and seems to have an awareness. So there is no such thing as physical awareness. Astral awareness alone is functioning even now in our physical bodies, which makes us aware in the first place. Maybe I phrased the question wrong. Um, what I meant to ask was when the physical, the first physical man was here, or when man descended to this planet, could he, did he have the ability to also go back and retain full awareness of astral phenomena? That ability he has been with man all the time. Why do you uh, choose to ask a question only about the first man, whether he had the ability? He certainly had the ability, but so has the man today. Because if I answer your question by saying yes, an implication will be there that the ability is lost because we are not the first man. This is not true. The ability continues even today. But can we imply that man had, man used this ability more so? It was easier for him to use the ability because there were less things tying him down here to prevent him from using the ability. We have the same ability that the first man had, but we, have, we don't use that ability because there are far too many things tying us down here to the physical forms around us. The first man did not have so much of creation around him to tie him down. Now we have made sophisticated arrangements to tie ourselves down to the physical universe. The various gadgetry of modern life, the civilizing forces around us, the new relationships with other beings, all this has made our minds go so much into the things physical around us that the ability which we possess to go back any time to the astral awareness is not being used. Uh, these are deterrents and obstructions to use of our abilities to become the astral man again. The first physical man did not have so much distraction and could more easily get back to his astral awareness. Well then, from that statement, then it seems to me with what we think of man as modern man as being 
evolved and using this criterion which you're stating. Seems as though we've lost. Yes, it is a question which will be asked a thousand years later, not ten or twenty years later. A thousand years later, when we have lost this process of civilization, then man will ask, was civilization a process of development or a process of loss? Then man will ask, have we paid too heavy a price for civilizing ourselves? Today we think we are progressing by civilizing ourselves, but we are paying a price, and the price I am mentioning to you, to lose the ability to get back to your real self is a heavy price to pay for civilizing ourselves. That is the price we are paying. Is the price too heavy? Man will still be asking this question a thousand years hence. Those beings that are, since there are many, many galaxies, many, many uh, planets and systems of planets in this, the physical level, and some of them are in the process of cooling, those astral beings, when they're on these hot planets, I guess they're in the astral form. When the elements become such that, that the conditions are habitable from a physical standpoint, uh, are they able to instantaneously materialize and create the matter necessary for functioning? Or is it a gradual phenomenon? The materialization is according to the law of karma. They are carrying with them the sun scars of what they have done in the past. And their materialization depends upon that. The astral forms with their minds, with their causal forms, carry all the previous karma. Without karma, they will not get any physical form. So with all that load of karma upon them, they can be born in a new planet, in a new galaxy. But what happens is, if a planet is ready, for habitation, quite a group of boys and girls from here who had a lot to do with each other on this earth may materialize as a group there now to work out the karma on the new planet. It will be unlikely for only one guy to go and sit down alone. Now, when this materialization process takes place, does it take place all of a sudden for all of them or with two or three like Adam and Eve or, you know, the parable of Adam and Eve? How does the materialization take place? I think two is the minimum number. Two is the minimum number. For any karma to be worked out, two seems to be the minimum number. But the more, the merrier, and the better. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.